We looked at the first five psalms on this channel, and we began by arguing that Psalms 1 and 2 should be read together as an introduction to the Psalter. We followed a number of commentators, both ancient and modern, that made that argument. And then we noted, beginning with Psalm 3, that you have this alternating evening-morning motif. Morning psalm, evening psalm, morning psalm. And here in Psalm 6, we have another evening psalm, where the psalmist is pleading with the Lord, presumably at night, in his bed, he's making his bed, swim with tears. And so this is the psalm we'll pick up with today. Now, I'm going to have a reading of the psalm, but I'm going to put it at the end. So I'll try to timestamp so you can jump back and forth if you would like to, so you can have the psalm in your head. So I'd encourage you to listen to it. But we'll go ahead and just jump in. And we'll begin here with the structure of the psalm, because it's really interesting. This is maybe the most perfect structured psalm that I've seen. I have not looked at all of them yet, but I'm just blown away by the symmetry of it. So all of the structural things I've seen so far... Everybody divides it this way with two cantos, which is two major sections. It's a very bifurcated psalm. It's very obviously divided into two. It has four strophes. You can usually detect the strophes in your modern day Bibles with a larger blank after a verse. And then there are 10 verse lines, basically verses, and 21 cola, which are lines. But basically everybody divides the psalm more or less this way, or actually exactly this way. Canto 1, which is verses 1 through 5, it's two strophes, five verse lines, and 39 words. And Canto 1 is addressed to God. Canto 2, things shift. And it's verses 6 through 10, but it's also two strophes, five verse lines, and 39 words, except these are words spoken about God. And those 39 words themselves can be divided up in a perfectly symmetrical way, in two different ways, actually. So the first way is in this numeric chiasm. What I mean by that is you have three verse lines totaling 24 words. The next set of verses, you have two verse lines, 15 words. Then it's going to flip that in the next canto, where you have two verse lines, 15 words, three verse lines, 24 words. So on a word level, it goes 24, 15, 15, 24, which equals 39 for canto one, 39 for canto two, 78 total, but those 39s can be arrived at in a different way. And if you followed along with this channel, one of those divisions is actually very interesting. Now, how you would get to that second way of dividing up that 39 is through the atnok, which is, it's a marker there for the purposes of recitation. It's like a rhythm to the text. It's a pause that you put there. Now, note, we are dealing here with the Psalter. We're dealing with the liturgy of the people. Presumably, some of these psalms were chanted together or sung together. They were set to music, things like that. And so when we have things like this, like markers denoting rhythms, essentially, I think we should take it very seriously, although we never do. Basically, no commentators do except for Labashain, which is the work that we're going to be relying on here. We talked about this a bit in the last video in uh, Psalm 5. But here we're looking at the Hebrew text, and what we want to note here is this particular thing right here. It's, it looks like an A without the crossbar, basically. So verse 1, would, we'll use it as an example. Now, his versification, the header, so he considers that its own verse. So for that reason, the versification is going to be a little bit off. It's going to be one verse off for your typical English translation. But anyway, verse 1 would be four words, then you get the pause. And then you have three more words. So verse one is seven words total or four plus three. Again, four words before the Adnach, three words after. Again, the Adnach being this pause in the text. But moving on, I want to look at verse two. Now, we're not going to go through every verse, but verse two is very noteworthy because you have five words here and then it continues on with two more. So you have seven total words and then you have the pause and then you have three more words. So you have 10 total. But the reason this is noteworthy is because the pause happens in the middle of a line, in the middle of a colon. So that's just, it's very bizarre that he does that. In fact, Labashain in his comments here, he says, the unusual placement of the Adnok right in the middle of a colon in verse 2b has to do with the author's desire, for some reason, to achieve two identical compositional formulae in the two halves of the text. So his point being, by putting the Adnok where he does, he creates this perfect symmetry between the two cantos. 
And so it gives us this 22 plus 17 before after the pauses structure. Now, if you followed along on this channel so far, you'll note immediately 17 because that is one of the values of the divine name Yahweh. Usually it's 26, but 17 can be arrived at either by the method of Gematria, where the 10 becomes a 1, or through a variant spelling of the divine name, where the Yod is replaced with an Aleph. It's a hypothetical form of the divine name, and Aleph numerically is 1, whereas Yod is 10. So again, you have that same difference. You have 17 instead of 26, so that could be another way you get there. In fact, 17 and 26 are both values for the term kavod, glory. This may explain why sometimes you have that close association with the name and glory. Glory to his name, or Moses' mother's name is Yochebed, the Lord is glory. So maybe that's why this is divided the way it is, 22 plus 17, but you get the 39 total words in each canto, which equals 78 total, which you may notice is three times 26. So it's a triple 26, the other divine number. And in fact, here in column D, you have 17. Now this is the words in the subordinate clauses, which seems kind of way out there, like maybe coincidental. But what's interesting is in the last Psalm, Psalm 5, there were 26 words in the subordinate clauses. So some of these things may be coincidental, but together, especially the symmetry of the Psalm is clearly intentional. But continuing on with some of the structure, there are 21 lines essentially in this Psalm. And you would think because it's so perfectly symmetrical, it would actually be 20, but you have a tricola in verse six. And so that gives you the structure of 10 plus one plus 10. So the middle line is, I am wearied with my moaning, which is the way he translates it, which is a fitting description of the Psalm. Now on a word level, you have 24 plus 30 plus 24. So verses one through three, the speaker calls on God to be gracious, 24 words. The center would be verses four through seven. He prays to God for deliverance, 30 words. And then verses nine and 10, he addresses his enemies. God will hear me, 24 words. And it should also be noted that you have this odd thing happening. So in Psalms four, five, and six, the headings of those are also four, five, and six words respectively. So perhaps coincidental, but maybe, maybe not. And Psalm 6 is actually by no means the only psalm that has that kind of symmetry going on, but I haven't studied out those yet, but we'll begin looking at the psalm itself. Now, as an introduction, uh, the Blackwell commentary, they point out that this is the first of seven penitential psalms, and that's been usually the focus of interpretation. And there are connections with some of the other psalms. In fact, Hamilton, in, in his commentary, gives a nice overlay here. He says, Psalm 6 moves from the personal reassurances found in Psalm 5 to an appeal that Yahweh not treat David the way his wicked enemies deserve to be treated. So that's an important aspect of the psalm, is he feels as if he is being the one under the threats of Psalm 2 that the enemies were supposed to be feeling. And so there's a lot of hooks back to Psalm 2. But continuing with Hamilton, he says, by means of the language he uses in Psalm 6, David indicates that he feels the way Psalm 2 said his enemies were to feel. But by the end, he is confident that the truths of Psalms 1 and 2 will obtain. Psalm 7 builds on Psalm 6 as a cry for just vindication. And then Psalm 8 stands as a confident assertion of Yahweh's purposes for the king from David's line. And once again, the heading is very noteworthy. To the choir master with stringed instruments according to the Shemineth, a psalm of David. And so we'll go ahead and take a look here. Now, the Greek text has for the end among hymns upon the eighth, a psalm of David. And so there's a lot of discussion about this phrase, upon the eighth, what that means exactly. And then for the end, we discussed that in the previous videos. That's the way the Greek translated it. So it tends to have this eschatological feel to a lot of the early commentators. And that's, in fact, especially in relation to the eight, that is the direction a lot of people took. So Augustine and many others, they considered the reference to the eighth as a reference to final judgment, the second coming, the eschaton, things like that. Didymus the blind, though, connected it to the eighth day uh, circumcision law. And this was kind of a trajectory that many later Jewish commentators also took. But I want to look at Gregory of Nyssa. He had an entire book he wrote about the inscriptions of the Psalms. 
And so he writes the inscription for the octave. Now, of course, that's, you know, for the eight or, you know, whatever, however, the Shemineth, that idea. He says, advises, therefore, that we not look to the present time, but that we look toward the octave. For whenever this transitory and fleeting time ceases, in which one thing comes to be and another is dissolved, and the necessity of coming to be has passed away, and that which is dissolved no longer exists, and the anticipated resurrection transforms our nature into another condition of life, and the fleeting nature of time ceases, and the activity related to generation and corruption no longer exists, the heptamad two, which measures time, heptamad is seven, or a group of seven, so here is referring to the week, will by all means halt. Then that octave, which is the next age, will succeed it. So again, he's taking this reference to the eight as like a reference to the eschaton, this eighth. So we have seven days of creation, basically, and we're like in the seventh day still. And so the next day, the day of the Lord becomes that eighth. It becomes the octave. And so when you get to that, then time ceases, all this kind of stuff. So he continues on. The whole of the latter becomes one day, as one of the prophets says when he calls the life which is anticipated, the great day. For this reason, the perceptible sun does not enlighten that day, but the true light, the sun of righteousness, who is designated rising by the prophecy because he is never veiled by settings. So very esoteric, but there is some logic to what he's saying. And similarly, Cassidorus also utilized Jewish tradition. After seven ages, the eighth will be when God comes to judge the world. So this is why they have this eschatological idea with the reference to the eighth. And of course, in the Greek, you have instead of with stringed instruments or rather to the choir master, instead of that, you have the idea for the end. Concerning this language of rebuke me not, this note by Theodore, and he says, discipline me like a father, he asks, not like a judge, like a physician, not like a torturer. And what's interesting is this language here, in your rebuke me not in your anger, that this really connects well with Psalm 2. Because twice you have in Psalm 2, you have speak to them in his wrath in verse 5 and then in verse 12, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Of course, this is the same language here. So perhaps it should better be translated as rebuke me not in your wrath to bring that resonance back with Psalm 2. And similarly, the next line, nor discipline me, also connects back to Psalm 2, where you have nor discipline me in your wrath. Psalm 210, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Hamilton translates the phrases respectively as nor correct me and receive correction. And he does so to heighten these connections between these first couple of Psalms. And similarly, this line, be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Be gracious to me is the first line of Psalm 4.1, except like the ESV translates it as have mercy on me, which kind of ruins the parallelism there. But uh, the rest of verse two, heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. Of course, troubled is going to be a term that comes up a couple times in this psalm. But also this line, again, connects to Psalm 2, where the bones are troubled. Psalm 2 has, then he will speak to them in his wrath, again, a word we looked at, and terrify them. Again, it's that same term here for troubled. So he'll terrify them in his fury. And so let me read here from Hamilton. He says, in Psalm 2, 5, Yahweh replies to the rebellion of his enemies by terrifying them. In Psalm 6, 2 and 3, or 2 through 3, David complains that what was supposed to happen to his enemies has happened to him. And he concludes the thought of 6, 3 by asking the Lord how long this state of affairs will continue. And then continuing, my soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? And that how long language actually connects also to Psalm 4. That's verse 2 that has that same language here. But this language of my soul is greatly troubled. Wilcock in his commentary says, Jesus himself takes up a phrase from each end of this psalm. My heart is troubled, John 12, 27, echoes verse three as he looks toward his death. Away from me, you evildoers. Matthew 7, 23 echoes verse eight as he looks towards his return. All who identify with him who want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings are bound to find themselves at some time in some measure, following the path of the rejected king and of his distant ancestor, David. But they too can rediscover their confidence in God's promises and express the whole experience in the words of this most heartfelt of Psalms. 
And Hamilton similarly makes the connection. He says, it is typological and that David's prayer in Psalm 6 points to one who, unlike David, will not suffer for his own sins, but for the sins of his people. One who willingly takes upon himself the punishment due to the enemies of God, who weeps over those who have rejected him, and whose vindication will indeed bring about the shamed terror of those who hate him, those who will meet a sudden destruction. And Hamilton highlighting here that it's David's own sin that he's suffering. Because if you go all the way back to Psalm 3, there it has the historical heading of when David fled Absalom. And of course, all of that stuff, the scandal with his whole family, is part of the punishment, part of the fallout for his own failings. In verse 4, Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. Of note here is the fact that this language, turn, O Lord, is language that God asks of the people. So as Hamilton points out, David sticks to his convictions that God is good and that his word is true. As he protests, he calls out to the Lord to turn and set things right. In 6.4, the term David uses to call Yahweh to turn in 6.4 is the one prophets use when they call Israel to repent. David is not charging Yahweh with sin, but he has suggested that he suffers what his enemies deserve. In 6, 1 through 3. So he calls Yahweh to turn from allowing things to be contrary to what Yahweh said it would be. And then, of course, he says, Save me for your steadfast love, for the sake of your steadfast love, which, of course, is Hasad. Hamilton is pointing out the connections between this 5 7, which also appeals to Hasad, and then 4 3, which most translations, like the ESV here, has that God or the Lord set apart for himself, him who is godly. And you'd have to go back to that Psalm 4 video where we talked about this particular way that Hamilton translates the term as loving kind one because he wants to bring out the resonance with the term has said. And then probably the area that received most attention is verse 5. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? So the early church fathers said a lot about this. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to hit the conclusion, basically, they take this very much as this idea that there is no repentance in the afterlife. And so as Theodore is going to write here, in any case, this is proper to the eighth day. Again, this octave thing that they were talking about, giving no longer opportunity for preparation by good or bad deeds to those who have arrived at it. Instead, whatever works you have sown for yourself, you will have occasion to reap. For this reason, he obliges you to practice repentance here there being no practice of this kind of effort in Hades. And similarly, Gregory of Nyssa echoes this idea. He says, For he who has made the inheritance known has also himself mentioned the octave, which becomes both the boundary of the present time and the beginning of the age to come. Now, what he's referring to here as the inheritance, and then he mentions the octave and that kind of stuff, he's referring to the previous Psalms headers. So in Psalm 5, for the end, again, that this was taken very eschatologically on behalf of the inheritance, the Psalm of David. And then here, again, we already noted the upon the eighth. So taking all of that together, the inheritance, the way that this was taken was as a reference like to believers, to the church, that kind of thing. So there's a, this eschatological idea for the end, and then this reference kind of to the church, the church age, the church people, and then the eighth being, you know, this idea of the judgment, the great judgment. And so Taking all of that together, the early church figures, many of them looked at this and saw this as a reference to the idea that there is no repentance in the afterlife, that this is it. So you have to repent now, turn now. But I really like this quote here from Reardon in his commentary. He says, the psalmist then speaks of death, for by sin, death entered into the world. Death is sin rendered visible. What we see death do to the body, sin does to the soul. Death is the externalizing of sin. Death is no friend. Apart from Christ, the Bible sees death as the realm where God is not praised. As the bitter fruit of sin, death is the enemy. Indeed, it is the last enemy, says 1 Corinthians 15.26. When the psalmist then prays for deliverance from death, he is talking about a great deal more than a physical phenomenon. Death is the last enemy, the physical symbol of our sinful alienation from God. For in death there is no memory of you, in the grave who will give you thanks. So for the sake of time, I'm mostly going to skip over verses 6 and 7, although there is a great quote in here by Gregory the Great. And the point he's making overall, though, is that the the grief, or sometimes rendered here as anger, 
And very often this is associated actually with the Lord being grieved or being angered, being provoked by idolatry and things like that. So Gregory looks at this and says that this is a legitimate response, but you don't want to let that righteous indignation disturb your tranquility. And the quote he gives is very much, it's like something you'd read out of Marcus Aurelius or something like that. And moving down to verse eight, depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. And it should be noted that this language is very reminiscent of Matthew 7, 21, 23, through that range where, you know, depart from me, I never knew you, those kinds of ideas. The workers of evil here, as Hamilton is going to point out, is, again, the exact phrase you get in 5.5. Five. And, of course, depending on the translation, that echo might not be brought out. And moving on, verse 9, the Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. And Hamilton, once again, in his commentary, says, the fact that Yahweh has heard David's plea, that Yahweh turn from the situation where David experiences what is due to his enemies, means that the enemies are about to experience what Yahweh said they would in Psalms 1 and 2. Thus, David announces in verse 10 that they will be ashamed and terrified, again using the term from 2.5. But this time, the right people experience the terror. Those who hate the Lord's anointed, when they turn back from their wicked plots and experience their sudden shaming, it will be like when driving away chaff. Psalm 1-4. Like the way of the wicked perishing. 1-6. Like those who have received fair warning being destroyed in the way. In Psalm 2-12. And this is from Longman's commentary. He says, The psalm, particularly with its lack of clear confession of sin, can be read as expressing the types of emotions Jesus experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death and asks God to take his cup of wrath away from him. He ultimately submits to God's will, which takes him on a collision course with those who want to kill him. But they will ultimately be overwhelmed with shame as the father hears his son's cry for mercy. And once again, in this phrase, all my enemies is exactly echoed in Psalm 37. But also here in the ESB, this language of greatly troubled echoes the same language used in Psalm 2.5, that he will terrify them. And so just another of these tight connections back to Psalm 2. But that is Psalm 6. To the choir master, with stringed instruments according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David... O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment.